Mr. Kwekuba Fukisiedu, and Dr. Vincent Okpata, and Dora Mensah, who were part of a committee to get the museum activated into a more engaging space in 2018. We would like to also to thank the current administration, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Rita Akusha Dixon, and her management team for also continuing in that flow of getting the museum activated and engaging as it was supposed to be. Now a brief on our categories of collection. Our collections range from modern and contemporary art and design, history, culture, ethnography, science and technology, and entrepreneurialism. Our modes of programming and dissemination include temporary exhibition on-site and off-site the main building near the commercial area. Artist lectures, seminars, film screenings, educational programming, community programming, research, consulting, publications, amongst many other things. The sources of our collections also range from purchases, bequeathals, loans, gifts from past students and the general public, the national partners, and so on. We also have a number of collaborators who will make these things possible in our museum. Our local international partners include the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, Tamale, Red Clay Studios in Tamale, and Nkrumah Volini, all in Tamale. These were all founded by our own Ibrahim Mahama, who's here to share part of his experiences with us today. Others are the Hand Museum in the University of Florida, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, University of Manchester, the Whitworth Art Gallery, International Council of Museums, Committee for Investing Museums and Collections, Rutgers University Museum, among many others. And last but not the least, start fully. I wish you all a great time. I hope that you enjoy this informative session. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Bojawa, for that on the Opukwari Museum. The lecture is soon to start, and to introduce the guest of honor, I invite Ajokise to do that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ajo Kisei. I'm a lecturer at the Department of Painting and Sculpture, and I'm delighted to be introducing Ibrahim Mahama. Ibrahim Mahama was born in Tamale, Ghana in 1987, where he currently resides and works. However, he shuffles between the cities of Accra, Kumasi, and Tamale which continue to inspire his colossal installations and practice generally. In art circles, his name has been synonymous with his spectacular installations made from repurposing predominantly jute sacks, a familiar and important material that facilitates the exchange of goods in markets, Ghana and around the world. In the last few years, these installations have ignited a sense of wonder by confronting unacquainted publics with the complex possibilities of contemporary art. Beyond challenging the residues of Ghana's colonial history, Mahama re regenerates out of Osagifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's unrealized economic emancipatory vision, potent material for proposing a new present through the abandoned state infrastructure and making out of them a place for artists, thinkers, and young people to learn, dream, and share. Through the establishment of the Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, Tamale, Red Clay Studio, and Nkrumah Volini, which are intent on re-engineering minds and the collective consciousness, he continues to stretch artistic practices today, preserve practices of yesteryear, whilst bridging the huge gaps between generations. 
I choose not to see as mere coincidence the organization of this important lecture in the great hall of this august institution exactly 50 years and a day after Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's unfortunate demise. Here, I would like to quote Osage for himself, who says, as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy in the knowledge that death can never extinguish the torch which I have lit in Ghana and Africa. Long after I am dead and gone, the light will continue to burn and be borne aloft, giving light and guidance to all people. This esteemed alumnus of Cairn University, Ibrahim Mahama, is represented by the Apalazo Gallery in Brescia, Italy, and one of the world's leading contemporary art galleries, White Cube, UK. In 2020, Mahama was honored as the principal laureate by the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development in the Netherlands. His work has appeared in numerous international exhibitions, including the NIRIN 22nd Biennale of Sydney, Australia 2020. Tomorrow, there'll be more of us. Selimbos Journal, South Africa 2020. Future genealogies, tales from the equatorial line, Sith Lubumbashi Biennale, Democratic Republic of Congo, 2020, 2019, sorry. Ghanaian Freedom, inaugural Ghana Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennale, Venice, Italy, 2019. Labor of Many at the Noval Foundation, Cape Town, South Africa, 2019. Documenta 14 in Athens, Greece, and Kassel, Germany, 2017. All the World's Futures, 56th Venice Biennale, Venice, Italy, where he participated as the youngest artist to be invited to participate. Artist Room at K21, Dusseldorf, Germany, 2015. Material Effects, the Broad Museum, Michigan State University, 2015, USA. An Age of Our Own Making, Reflections 1 and 3, Kunsthal Charlottenburg, Copenhagen and Holbeck, 2016. And Fracture, Tel Aviv Art Museum, Israel 2016, to list but a few. In March 2019, Mahama opened the art, artist-run space Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, SCCA in Tamale, followed by the opening of the vast studio complex, Red Clay, in nearby Janakim in September 2020. Encompassing exhibition space, research facilities, and an artist residency hub, both sides represent Mahama's contribution towards the development of and expansion of the contemporary art scene in his home country with implications across the world. In April 2021, Mahama opened a renovated silo in Kumavolini in Tamale, the third artistic and educational institution he has opened in northern Ghana over the past few years. His works have sold in the millions of dollars, the process of which he plows back into building and running the institutions he has set up. Ibrahim Mahama currently has his inaugural solo exhibition in the Far East, the title of which is inspired by Nigerian, Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie's Half of a Yellow Sun at the White Cube, Hong Kong. I hope that through Ibrahim Mahama's lecture today, we're reminded of the light which was lit by Osajifu Dr. Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana and Africa through his selflessness. Ladies and gentlemen, let's invite Ibrahim Mahama with a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening to you all. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back here at KN University, which I always say is my first love. Um, I came here, I think, as a student in 2006. So I'm very honored to be here, uh, almost, yeah, I guess, 16 years later, at least to be able to share whatever I have learned, both from here and also throughout my experiences around the world. Um, where do I start from? 
Um, I'd like to thank uh, the Provost, uh, Professor John Tia Bugri, um, for making this happen. <laughs> um, I'd like to also thank the Dean of the Faculty of Art, uh, Professor Charles Springfong. I'd like to thank um, the Head of Department, uh, Professor Bojawa, uh, and also the Head of the Museum, uh, the Opoku Wai Second Museum, uh, together with his colleagues, uh, IUB and others, for making this um, lecture happen. I would also like to thank um, yeah, my fellow colleagues and uh, fellow students also here. I'm still a student here since I'm still on a PhD program, so <laughs> I'm not exactly an alumnus yet. <laughs> Maybe when I finish, I'll become an alumnus. Uh, thank you very much. I, when I was uh, asked about this lecture, I was, there were many questions in my head regarding what I could speak about because over the last couple of years, I've been doing quite a number of research around like uh, institutional building and also just into my practice, into looking at material forms and like issues concerning labor and all that. And I've been dealing with this question of the void, uh, both in a material sense and also in a political sense. So I thought it might be interesting for us to be able to just open up the question of what the void is, the constitution of it, through my practice from the very beginning when I started practicing as an artist in 2014, professionally. Yeah, but before that, I was working significantly here at the university, uh, doing experiments and other things. So um, I guess I'm going to start um, the presentation from this, um, just one sec. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope I don't get into trouble with my professors. <laughs> I love these two uh, images. Uh, so these are images that I took back in 2016. These are images that I took back in 2016 uh, at the famous MFA stairs um, at uh, the painting and sculpture department uh, where normally as uh, professors, lecturers come together to be able to eat and to be able to discuss ideas and things like that. Um, I guess um, the, the, the real gift of my work is that I found myself here at, uh, in Kumase at the painting and sculpture department as a student uh, back in 2006 to 2010 where we met various professors, uh, lecturers, colleagues uh, who inspired us. Uh, I think uh, the most significant was uh, Professor Karikacha who always somehow opened up the possibilities in terms of re uh, rethinking about art, the context of art. I guess most times when people think about art, what they think about is um, just, uh, they, they reduce it down to a certain sheer creativity and all that. But with regards to thinking about the context of the gift, like how do you convert the thing that we call art that is mostly seen as a commodity or as an object into a gift. So I started, like I really, started paying attention to what it means, at least uh, collectivity, in terms of people coming together in order to produce whatever it is, whether they're producing objects or producing ideas or whatever there is. So I think that these two images somehow captures the spirit of this idea of transcending beyond the idea of uh, commodification in a way. Um, I, I, I somehow, started thinking about some of these things a lot more seriously later in my practice, but I like to go back and forth in between them. So um, I, you know, historically, Nkrumah built a lot of uh, infrastructure. One of the most significant ones was the silo which he built across the country, a lot of which have even been forgotten in time and memory. Um, in Tamale, there is one of them which I was fortunate enough to have acquired as part of the institution in Tamale. But um, I was really thinking about what it means for, our, let's say, cultural practitioners or artists within a time to be able to insert themselves within a certain historical form or order. That's where the idea or the concept of the gift, uh, the void actually lies much deeper. So um, the silos which were built to contain these commodities, cocoa, which was being transported to England and other places during the colonial period, which was never finished in the post-independent era, was completely abandoned. As an artist, what I do is that I actually, yeah, the screen is still on, so I'm sure it's from there, yeah. As an artist, what I do is that I mostly um, 
acquire these uh, like these old uh, cocoa sacks, and the cocoa sacks are very important because they are sacks that are normally imported into Ghana from Southeast Asia, actually for the transportation of uh, cocoa from the ports straight uh, to the from the farm straight to the port, and they use the, they use the port uh, the the cocoa bags only once. So I, beca I became very much interested in this idea of using this container just once, but also the memories and residues that are somehow trapped and buried within these uh, containers. Because once you use it to carry cocoa, the residues are somehow left within it. And uh, they sell it to market women who use it to, in transporting maize, onions, and other things, and eventually charcoal. So I like the idea that the material gets to a point where it becomes stained, that you can no longer use it to be able to transport the idea of this valuable commodity as cocoa. So in art, there is always this point of transition. Like you can be able to take an object and you can be able to transform it into a point where it's, uh, it produces new forms of residues and new forms of capital. So I started thinking about the idea that I could somehow uh, be inspired by this idea of crisis in terms of spaces, historical spaces, through certain material residues like the sack, uh, uh, collecting them, uh, working together with collectives, uh, kayas and all kinds of people around the country, to be able to produce something which is more tangible as a, like a commodity that goes into the art market. And then once it goes into the art market, whatever residue that is produced out of it, mostly which is capital and influence and all that, it should be able to come back into the system in which you find yourself in, in order to be able to produce other forms within itself. Um, so I make a diagram here, which is very chaotic, but is this just simply looking at the idea of the sack uh, uh, going to become an artwork, which comes back into the same material which would have been thrown away. Now that it's become art, it produces a capital that comes back into buying the same building that the, uh, the cocoa should have been stored in. And then now it can inspire, let's say, building of other institutions, whether being at future institutions or whatever there are. And through that also, like, uh, the idea of art in itself, in its form, whether being it painting, sculpture, technological forms, and every other thing begins to open up. Uh, um, yeah, one of the most uh, significant um, like collages that I've been working on the past couple of years was this particular image where as part of the research that I do, I also collect a series of um, like textbooks from uh, primary schools, aside taking drone photographs of like old abandoned buildings and things like that. And this, the, the silo at the bottom is a, a, a drone photograph I took of the whole silo in, a whole, uh, in the Volta region um, a couple of years ago. And the, 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 the text on the, the primary school book says that non-living things do not make babies, non-living things do not eat, do not grow, do not fall sick, do not play, uh, non-living things do not rest. But um, I like the idea that these buildings, when we think of buildings as uh, non-living things, I think that it's actually a living thing because uh, living things do all the other things that the non-living things are not meant to do. But the idea that in time and in history, we somehow had discarded quite a significant amount of, let's say, forms, residues, and all kinds of things, which held a lot of potential. I thought that's where the void, the, the, what's the, name, the burden of the void came from in the capital of... Uh, the promises of capital failures. Uh, because when we look closely at spaces, we look closely at things that have either been abandoned or things that have somehow been left to the peripheries, sometimes, or the things that have failed the most at ground zero, sometimes that's where we can actually pick up freedom even from and we can expand it. Um, I had this habit of going to, um, just going to sites, taking photographs, things like that. This is uh, uh, an image of uh, a woman at uh, Kwame Nkrumah Circle when they were building the, when they started building the interchange, where she is uh, carrying both fruits on her head. And I used to go there taking phone, just pictures with my phone. And on one occasion, I took a couple of pictures, and when I, when I went back home, I was looking at them, and this one seemed particularly interesting. It's almost as if uh, the woman is carrying the, the, the construction, the, the loading of the concrete and everything on the head. And there's this sense of transparency where you see the buffloats and uh, the softness of it through that together with the, 
uh, the concrete and everything, and also with the workers on top with the labor and order. So I started making these analogies between that and um, the, the silos in terms of the architectural form, like looking at the structure and also like the current forms that they were in Tamale, like with bats occupying these spaces and all that, which I'll show more images of later. Um, so um, the, the jute bags, as I spoke about before, the residues which are on them are very, very important. They are flat and they do more of what the infrastructure that I've been looking at in the last couple of years actually do. Because you know, when people buy or inherit these materials, what they do is that they tend to write abbreviations, names, and other things onto them. And I'm very much interested in what they symbolize, both on a symbolic level and also just on a political level in terms of what the material actually means um, in relation to, let's say, original text like the Ghana Cocoa Board and all that. Um, I also did a series of um, um, photographs which combined the, the hand because you know that a lot of the Kai is, and historically when market traders or people moved from one place to the other, mostly from the rural areas to the urban centers, they used to write their names on their bodies in a form of tattoos and all that. It's like a biodata. But in time, it's become very common mostly among the Kai is. And um, I somehow also wanted to draw the relationship between that on the body, the conditions that they carry, versus, let's say, the conditions that are carried within, let's say, objects around us, like the Goku bag, and also like um, the image on the right-hand side, which is uh, the interior letter of one of the trains from Second D, from the post-independence era, some of which are also from the colonial days, of uh, trains which have been scrapped, and then the internal parts burnt. So how do we look, relook at the relationship between the body and, let's say, these historical forms? Because sometimes we don't even pay attention to them. If you look down closely, you realize that there is a GRC sign, which is the Ghana Railway Corporation. So I very much like these uh, relationships between texts and also forms and all that. And sometimes in the studio, we would get, go into these gestures because I work with a huge team of different people across the uh, country uh, doing different things. Um, I forgot to uh, thank my two very good friends and studio assistant, Benjamin Nakante and uh, Francis Selom, eh, Francis uh, Jiwonu, uh, who have been the backbone of my practice actually since the very beginning. So thank you very much. Um, the, yeah, so these ones are very, 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 very important in, with regards to like thinking about this gesture of, let's say, exploring the, the textual qualities. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thank you. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So looking at texts, like uh, working with the collaborators in uh, in Ghana. Um, like in Accra and working with the text. I wonder why it's not full screen, but I guess it works. <laughs> yeah, so uh, working with these uh, text forms with regards to like writing text and like somehow transferring them onto objects and all that. I also did a significant amount of work with regards to thinking about the, the idea of the sites of production. Because when you're producing a work of art, the idea of the artist's studio is not just a place where the artist goes in solitude to be able to think and produce, but also like there is a huge constellation of spaces around us that can contribute actually to the, the reading of a work of art in a way. So I was going around market spaces, uh, Malamata markets, where the women were extremely helpful. They were giving me all the help and morale to be able to do this work. Um, the KNUST um, Catholic Church uh, before, when they started building it. It was one of the spaces that I, I went to and I saw the, the priest and he was very, he didn't understand what I was doing, but he was very supportive. Yeah, I always, KNUSD is the best actually because I don't think anywhere in the world I would have had this, um, this amount of. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think I would have had this amount of support in order to be able to experiment on that scale as an artist because, of course, we know the works of uh, artists like Christo and Jean-Claude and many others, which would have taken them decades to be able to do some of the work that I did within a very short time in my practice. So the, 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 the institution with regards to its openness and also the department itself with regards to professors who were heads of departments at the time who were willing to support, um, I think, some of the early days, uh, Kisi Edubwa for Castro was the head of department, so he really helped with a lot of letters and also flowing up on personal meetings and things like that. So without that, that wouldn't have happened. Whereas maybe in other art schools, uh, you're left on your own as an artist to go and fight for yourself. So um, I think that was important. The other bridge, the image on the other side is a bridge, Biposo, uh, across the River Pra when you're going to Sekendi. Uh, there's a tow route around there, which I also worked with. I was also going to the railway second D where I would uh, explore with like uh, spaces in between the railway. Like it's really interesting that uh, a space that is actually, yeah, you find like engine parts and all kinds of other things, but we produce work there. And sometimes the spillage of oil and other things accumulates within these materials. So when you see the artwork hanging over a building in Europe or whatever, there are certain references that are made within it materially that sometimes maybe the artist may not talk about, but it's there, it's inferred within the work itself. Um, the Opokuwari Second Museum, which was the first actually project that I did on campus when I was doing my MFA back in 2011 to 13, um, which was, um, yeah, it was exciting. It's, it was a bit scary at the time to do this work uh, because it was only the third project I was working on at the time when I started working on this scale. But uh, with the support of the department and my colleagues, it was, um, it was very possible. Um, the museum, uh, the new library, which uh, was my final master's MFA project, uh, which uh, I remember very well, Dr. Karikacha and, and uh, Castro uh, helped me to talk to the librarian, the chief librarian at the time which um, it came out really well, because I wasn't really sure how, and it was just a few days before prior, but we were able to make it happen. Um, and I also did a project titled The Exchange Exchanger, where I covered all the, um, the, great, the halls, the annexes on campus, from Africa to independence to, yeah, it was a really ambitious project, and also projects housing, affordable housing at Asakari Mampon and other places. Um, the Great Hall, which we are sitting in, was also one of the projects. This was uh, under the invitation of Professor Bridanso, the former Vice Chancellor. And it was actually very significant because art has come really a long way. Because a couple of uh, years ago, I think it would have been very crazy to think that uh, the, the university would actually invite an artist to be able to realize this kind of a monumental project on the most significant building on the university campus. Um, on a time when like, the president, the, uh, the chancellor, everyone gathers within it. I think the idea that um, we've been able to create, um, we've been able to create uh, new forms of uh, thinking or new forms of relations within this particular period is a true success to like, the evolving forms of art and what it's, uh, the potentials that it holds uh, within our society and also within this space. Yeah, so in that we worked with various collaborators from Asia, like all the other projects, uh, also Kais who were coming from Accra uh, that we worked with as we did with the Exchange Exchanger and also with like uh, various departments, the security on campus and all that. So the, the range of people that are always involved in realizing projects are very, very, very enormous. And these are some of the images from Asokori Mampong from the affordable housing back then in 2015. And you realize that some of these things might repeat in some of the later images that I will show um, of like animals um, within the image, sometimes photographing spaces without uh, human forms, uh, but just concentrating on what the, the space is, the constellation of things. Um, yeah, and this was at the Edum uh, Bridge in 2014 also. Um, this work was what inspired the Venice Biennial when I was invited by Okuin Wezo in 2015 
uh, but in the same year, 2014, uh, out of bounds, because when you go to the bridge, they have all this text out of bounds written on it. So uh, a friend of mine, Osei Bonsu, and I decided to title the work after this project I had done at the time. Um, so Kumase has been very, very, very kind, actually. Um, this was at um, the uh, Ghana Civil Aviation Building in Accra in 2014 also. So a lot of these images that you're seeing are very early work uh, that I made. And also as part of the exchange exchanger, the silo, one of the Nkrumah silos at Accra, um, sim some of these symbolic projects that were done in the period. Um, the, one of the, also the old projects that were done also in the post-independence era, which has been privatized now, which we also worked with. And also looking at, um, and it wasn't always just buildings, but it was also all kinds of other spaces, drainage spaces, gutters, because as, when you're making art, always the first question is that, but who is going to see this? Like, how many people will see it? But sometimes it's not so much about the people, it's about the relationship between things. Art is always about relationship between things and also about the freedoms that are opened up within this idea of, uh, because before you start, sometimes you think that, oh, the thing is closed up, so how can I open it a lot further for something else to emerge out of it? And um, I put it next to this. So this is in a project that I did with my colleague, Bernard Akwe Jackson, uh, with a curator, Bonaventure in Duku, uh, in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, an old, uh, the King's Palace, uh, Kunsa Schalatenburg. It's, uh, the, it's called, it was called the Schalatenburg Palace anyway, but it was a place where sugar, uh, the, the, the processing of sugar from the sugar plantations and things like that. So it's a very historical. It goes back hundreds of years. So for me as an artist, I'm interested in the relationship between these two forms. Like what does it mean to be able to produce a work that goes in a drainage system in uh, Alajo uh, versus going to, um, let's say, um, yeah, going to Copenhagen and then eventually maybe going to Venice in the biennial or something like that. The relationships are very important. And uh, Venice was very important in the sense that it really opened up like, yeah, because you know, as African art, each time we think about art, it always comes back to, let's say, historical body forms and things like that. So the idea of working with materials which were really abstracted on that scale was really important at the time. Um, um, yeah, so I also worked on this project in Tel Aviv at the Modern Art Museum where we were playing with the forms of parts of the museum and things like that, um, which I think was very important in terms of like opening up the possibilities of the work, the formal qualities. And this was at the 52nd uh, Sydney Biennial uh, back in uh, 2020, just before COVID hit. I think I was there with Francis, and um, we came home just two days, and then there was a, a lockdown. So if we hadn't come home, probably would have been in Australia by now, and <laughs> I don't think we would have been citizens anyway, but we would have been stuck there uh, nonetheless. So um, it's, it, there's, a pos there's a huge possibility, like uh, formations of works that I've done over the years. The non rentable in cancer, which was made up of shoemaker boxes, uh, which I worked on the textile fabric pieces, which I was working on in the MFA, Library of Caricature Seydoux, which is down there on the left, and then also like a grain of wheat, which was these works that I made in Greece and Germany during the documenta period, 2017. Uh, so working as an artist and trying to think of a wide variety of forms with regards to what it can do to the art ecosystem as an artist. Um, also like, works that I've produced, either collages, drawings, which are inspired by many different forms. Yeah. So these are from the last exhibition in London at the White Cube Gallery, uh, Lazarus, which were made up of these collages, photographs taken of bats inside the Nkrumah silo in, uh, in Tamale, together with uh, old colonial maps. And also, um, um, yeah, logos, graphic logos from the railway in combination with, let's say, photographs from, uh, photographs of the bats from the silo. Yeah, and uh, this was one of the main works in the exhibition, um, yeah, titled uh, Capital Corpses. Yeah, it was a work that was inspired on my interest in collecting old sewing machines from Agbubloshi. 
So I mostly go around just collecting things. As a student, I just used to go around photographing spaces, collecting objects. And sometimes I might produce a work now with it, and you think that, oh, Ibrahim just made this work. But actually, I've actually been collecting this material for probably several years. So I was collecting these materials back in 2000 and I think uh, 15 or so. Uh, just in my interest in these machines, because the machines themselves, when they get to a certain point where they are no longer running, they might either uh, throw them away, discard them or whatever. So there are these guys, the scrap dealers, condemned guys, they go around collecting these objects. So I commissioned them actually to go and collect as many as they could for me. And we collected over 2,000 machines. And I was like, what do I do with these 2,000 machines? By the time I was doing my work, at a, like research at the railway, and I thought, oh, I could create an installation at the railway with these uh, machine parts and try to bring them back to life. Because when you connect them with motors and they run, they make this really irritating sound, like, like they're struggling to move. And I, at some point, I thought I could combine them with these desks, old colonial desks because when they move, they vibrate, and they create all these really interesting sounds. It's almost like an orchestra in a way. And uh, at some point, I also thought that why not throw in some blackboards from uh, some of the schools. So a series of exchanges here and there. So this work was created, Capital Corpses, and it was shown as part of the exhibition in London, uh, Lazarus, which is currently being owned by a, 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 a Brazilian museum, actually. But the idea was to be able to at least create a work that somehow uh, would uh, further look into some of these material forms and conditions. Um, so, yeah. so now I will jump into the very subtle and also political work that I also do, like some part of independent work. So I started, at some point, I, I was working on this uh, work titled The Parliament of Ghosts uh, for a, a museum in Manchester, the Whitworth. And um, I was basically interested in my history, going to the railway, collecting all kinds of uh, materials, uh, residues, like old uh, furniture, like uh, photographs and all kinds of other things, in order to be able to produce a, like, a, a constellation of spaces that could re allow us to rethink about the concepts of the void and also the ideas of ghosts or things like that. Yeah, so... I started collecting photographs of like workers from the railway, looking at the, the images themselves, silver gelatine prints and other things, what they mean actually, in terms of their formal qualities. Um, some of them were images that I took in Ghana, and some of them were images that I took in England, in York, where they have the National Railway Archive. Uh, so these were taken in York um, on a research trip that I did. And looking at how, because sometimes when issues of restoration and other things are happening within there, because within our society, the government mostly doesn't really understand what it means, what some of these spaces mean. And also the, uh, the residues that are uh, trapped within these spaces. So it's not as if we need to renovate a space, so we just go there and then we take everything away and then we make it new. Sometimes the old, as rough and rugged as it is, is far more important than somehow trying to beautify or somehow make it aesthetically pleasing. So I have been going back and forth in between some of these spaces. That's been, I'm a witness. So I like using the idea of a witness. It's almost like you are like a time traveler in a way where you're able to go back and forth in between time to be able to look at things and borrow ideas from in as much as it's a capital, uh, it's a capital failure in terms of the image, but there's also so much that is produced out of it that you can somehow borrow from it. Um, yeah, so looking at uh, some of the spaces, um, there was a work I did in New York recently, the 57 Forms of Liberty, uh, which was uh, like an old chimney existing around the, I think this is the, the foundry room. And recently I went there and, and I realized that they had scrapped the whole place. Um, yeah, so I, I took an image of it because I go back and forth in between it. So those capital failures, there's a lot actually to look at within those spaces in terms of artistic work. So then I come to um, Tamale, to uh, Jana Chang, as Ajo rightfully pronounced. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, it's a rural community which I decided to establish my studio in back in 2014, uh, 14, 15. And um, we've, at Black Star Lines, uh, we've always been interested in this uh, emancipation and also the, uh, the concept of the gifts that I spoke about before. How do we transform art from a point of commodity into a gift? And also like to be able to shift away from the modernist canon in terms of looking at, let's say, 
uh, how modern art inspired the birth of modern art institutions and things like that, the relationship between labor and also forms that are created within it. There's a very important uh, figure at the studio. His name is Assemblyman Zakaria. And um, he's been very much responsible for uh, taking care of the studio when I'm not there. He's there all the time. Imagine I am like there like only half of the year or less but he's there even more. And he was there far before I came or people within the community. But he's a very important character because the relationship that we formed over the years as someone who is a caretaker or someone who even contributes his own labor actually to the development of a space, like the studio. Like you can see him there being part of the people digging the foundation. But on the other hand, you also see him as someone who is giving tours to school children about the work of, let's say, Olafur Eliasson. And uh, in, when you travel around modern art institutions, you always realize that the labor that goes actually into building of spaces, when it comes actually to even the content, there's always a disconnect between that. And for me, art, shouldn't, we shouldn't be able to separate those things. It's, there are two things which are, which are together. Uh, it's very important. So I thought that in doing that, there are so many emancipatory forms that could be created out of it, with regards to really paying attention to the labor forms that goes into the building of uh, spaces and what it means for the future. So in here, you find Assemblyman again, taking like uh, people from the community, local villages who, because you know, when you go to like the rural areas and all that, when people dress up, like I mean really dress up, they're either going for a funeral or for an outdooring and like they're going to bring their takeaway home, something like that. It's, <laughs> it's very serious. But I like this idea that suddenly people wake up and they dress up because they're going to the artist studio or they're going to the art institution or whatever because of the material residues and also things that are contained within it, like in terms of what the artist studio offers. All these things... <laughs> Hello? Well, I guess this still works. <laughs> Maybe we're lucky that the, the projectors at the top might still be working if we connect them. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just talk through some of the images when the power comes back on, we can continue. Yeah, so um, it's really important with regards to the idea of this shift now that um, ordinarily people are able to somehow still go into the idea of the contemporary art institution. Um, with the idea, yeah, because now we are working with the idea of crisis and failures, failures as a starting point. Because when you're starting from ground zero, then in terms of uh, freedoms and emancipation, there is so much that you can actually look at or the potentials that actually exist within that. Um, so I thought that would be particularly interesting to explore. Yeah, there is a particular image on the screen now where Assemblyman uh, makes a connection between the, the silver gelatine prints and um, the, the, the railway sleepers, that's the railway roads, uh, the material forms which have all these termite molds um, within them. Yeah, and some of them also were images that I was uh, trying to look at the idea of restaging uh, some of these historical photographs. Like when you look at um, some of the silver gelatine prints, you see some of the um, colonial agents within the time in front of some of the steam locomotives that were brought to Ghana, um, actually for the setup of, like say, the Takwa or the secondary railroads, which were some of the early railroads that were formed in the western region. And um, noun versus, let's say, some of these residues which are, let's say, have traveled all the way to Tamale or to the northern region, a place where the railway was never really extended onto because they didn't think that it was that they were um, 
commodities there which would have been exploited like gold or manganese or any other thing. Uh, so I like the idea that now these um, old historical forms which were once uh, filled with like uh, failures and crisis now becomes this new, um, yeah, it becomes this new sense of, like it forms these new sense of potentials where different generations are able to connect to and also to be able to read new forms of meanings from, in a way. So there are some, uh, there's a portraiture which is within it, which would have been lovely to see. Uh, but I guess when the, the lights come back on, we can run through some of the images again. And uh, um, there is an image of uh, the excavation of the Nkrumah Vwalini in Tamale, where we, as artists, are looking at the idea of taking an old building, which is inspired by uh, capital failures and all that, and somehow uh, using, let's say, modern uh, uh, building technological um, yeah, forms in order to be able to excavate, like, let's say, an old existing building and bring it back to life, um, and bring it back to life. Sometimes you really ask yourself whether us people with living within our generation, whether it is really our work to be able to do some of the things that we do. But I think it is, because beyond the states, uh, individually also, there is a lot more that we can do sometimes that has certain potential that maybe the state will not be able to realize because of all the bureaucracies and other things attached to itself. So I like this idea that the, the concept of painting could be expanded through some of these uh, forms. Um, yeah, and uh, one of the most important um, projects that I think that I have done in the last couple of years was rebuilding this Parliament of Ghosts project from Manchester, actually in Ghana, in Tamale, as part of the studio. Uh, so through this series of lecture, I will show a series of photographs which are actually looking at the concept of the Parliament, the Parliament of Ghosts, and what the constitution of it is, with regards to looking at the ideas of non-human characters, from soil to plants to animals to uh, ash to all kinds of other things which are possessed within it. But also looking at the relationship between, for instance, excavating land to be able to build, let's say, a permanent architectural form uh, versus uh, excavating, let's say, a building like Nkrumah Vwalne to, be, to bring it back to life, a building that has been abandoned for almost 60 years. What does it mean for us to be able to physically go into it, to be able to take out soil and other material forms in order to be able to make it accessible for another generation? But also, what does it mean for us to be able to, what does the excavation process mean in terms of us traveling back and forth between time? Um, Nkrumah Volney is interesting because when I, when I bought this building in 2020 for the institution which we made a trust for uh, in Tamale, the idea was that uh, why don't we save some of these uh, existing historical buildings? But we didn't really know what the constitutional forms of these spaces were. But the history of the building is that in the 1960s, when the building was being built, there was a lot of rumor going around that Nkrumah was building these buildings as um, prison, prisons and also political detention centers because he was building it, he was building it at a time with these uh, Russian, Polish architects, former Yugoslavian architects and all that. And um, at the time during the Cold War, there was a huge propaganda from the CIA and also at the Nkrumah's opposition at the time that Nkrumah was building these spaces as military forms, bankers, nuclear bankers and all that. So after having called it the Nkrumah Vwalini, so the Vwalini in our language, when they say Vwalini, there, there are two words, there's Vwali. Vwali means a hole, but Vwalini is like inside a hole. It's almost like, um, like a place of torment, a place of no return. And I like the idea that because it's Vwalini, you can almost relate it to the idea of the void. And Vwalini as a place, uh, the Nkrumah Vwalini was abandoned for a very long time. And in time, water started gathering in it. So during the rainy, uh, the dry season, it was the only place that people could go in Tamale to actually get water from. A place where no one wanted to have anything to do with. And sometimes children would go there to either swim or fetch water. And unfortunately, there were some deaths happening within the building where children would slip and fall into the water and drown. So the city thought that the building was cursed and the only way to somehow prevent people from going there or to prevent disasters was to seal it. So they poured tons and tons and tons of soil into the building in order to conceal it. But 
over time, the building was not concealing because they didn't realize, no, no one knew the depth of the building and what was underneath it because of the myth. They didn't want to deal with it. Okay, we thank God. Um, so when, um, when it happened, yeah, I think um, some, somewhere in the 1980s, a lot of sand was actually poured into the building to conceal it. Uh, so when we bought it, the idea was to take out the soil from it so that the building could become accessible. And once the building became accessible, we realized that there was a ton of uh, bats living within the building. And the bats are particularly interesting because as artists, and this was during COVID period, like the height of COVID, where over one million people had died from COVID. And of course, we all know the usual suspect from COVID. Everyone was pointing to like bats and like, and the, 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 the fact still remains that human beings have been the greatest threat on the planet, not animals or any other thing. So it was very important somehow to relate. Yeah, it was very important to somehow go back to this, um, yeah, to be able to go back to this form, like to this question of what it means to be able to at least um, occupy this void, this new void that we were. And when you break down volini in Dagbani, v in Dagbani means to pull out, to excavate, to uh, transform. The second word, lil, is like to teleport or to magically disap uh, trans uh, disappear. If they say the guy, Uda Lilme, it's like he, he vanished. There's a mystery around it. So I like the idea of the mystery within the word. And there's also the last word, ni. If in Dagbani, when they say that, nmani, like it's like a specific place. So the volini as a word itself was a bit of a, dis like in terms of the reading, was a bit of a disaster, a crisis situation. But as soon as you deconstruct it, it's almost like potential. It's like, because if the same volini is the same thing that invites us to be able to rethink about forms, occupation, and all that. So we thought, why not name the building in Koma Volini after the same crisis? Um, so I think before I was looking at, um, I had shown some few images, which, yeah, so these were some of the images that I was talking about, like looking at the, the, the excavation of the silo in order for the renovation to happen. Yeah, or the historical forms of the railway and trying to reenact some of these things, but this time around using the historical residues actually to produce uh, various installations or archival forms within the within the artist studio where the, yeah, it's like history is so dense and when you're presenting it, it cannot be as dense as it is. Sometimes it has to be playful or it has to be something that is a bit loose. So uh, we try as much as possible to rethink about some of these uh, forms through the work that we do. Yeah, and this is uh, going into the parliament of ghosts, the idea of excavating a space in order to build this new, uh, this new forms. So these are some of the images from the Nkrumah Volney where we are excavating the space with like members of the community. And sometimes you might think it's some kind of a galamse exercise going on there, but it's just digging back into time. Like, and you can't also pretend that because you are digging the building back to where it was in 1966, you can use it for what it is. You can't because now the building has accumulated a new form of form that allows us to be able to reach out to chat new forms of histories and all that. And, uh, and the, with regards to the airplanes, like buying the airplanes, taking them to Tamale and taking out the seats in order to use them for um, like classrooms and things like that, it was similarly to looking at the silo because the silo you are somehow excavating and pulling out, but to be able to transform. So the issues of transformation are very important with regards to the work, irrespective of the form of the space and also of the work. Yeah, whether they are human characters, with Sakite uh, teaching drone uh, technology classes within the airplane, or bats occupying the silo. They are all different types of occupants, whether they are bacteria, microbes, or whatever that are occupying these spaces. So the occupation doesn't necessarily have to be reduced down to human forms, yeah. So looking at, let's say, things that happen within a drawing activities and all kinds of other things. Um, um, now that we own the means of production, it gives us different freedom, sets of freedoms to rethink about how we reconstitute the images within our society and all that. 
Uh, I always like to joke that when you saw images coming from Tamil Air, the north is either children with uh, flies around their mouth with uh, chasing after cattle or things like that. But I think in through art, these forms begin to change with regards to creating like new, and it's, it's not like it's a photograph where you can sell or anything, but it's what the transformational quality within the work itself. Um, and in here we have uh, one of our students, Hajara, who is uh, also working on like the drone workshops where we do these drawing classes within the cockpit, combining them with like um, the interface of like new drone, like uh, um, control sticks and things like that. It's interesting that all the instruments that exist within the cockpit now goes into the interface of the mobile phone. So for us, it was also very important to be able to collide those two histories. Yeah, I like the idea that when those two things come together, it almost creates these new forms of singularity that allows for certain imaginations to sprout, which ordinarily maybe wouldn't have happened. And um, we have like, so the next images I'll just be going through as I speak, which goes into like the parliament of ghosts, the forms within it, like uh, some of the drawings that I would have done uh, the birds of dreams with like the, the cement paper hats looking into labor forms and all that. But making these drawings actually into the, into the, into the, 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 the building itself. Because as an artist, we are not architects who have all the ideas before we start the project. For us, yeah, we start and then something works, that something doesn't work, and then we redraw and we go back and forth in between it. So these are cement paper hats made up of more than 20,000, like cement papers coming from construction sites and all that, but used actually in making almost like this library or repository together with like uh, archival uh, papers coming from like the railways and all kinds of other things. But the idea that now the cement paper wraps around these things and it somehow creates these uh, libraries, uh, for me I thought was something that the parliament could look at. And if you look up there, you realize that some of the jute sacks uh, are also stored in between them. And like in terms of looking at like the, yeah, sometimes like removing molds and the molds forming uh, abstract forms within the space. Um, cr uh, creating these um, uh, conversational points around these spaces again. Yeah focusing on these ideas of like different witnesses within this space, both from like children within the community and also like colleagues, um, Benjamin, uh, Salom, and Sakite at the space. Um, occupying it with various objects like these old 20th century, uh, 19th century chairs that were also established due to like uh, certain workshops, craftsmanships that were done within the colonial days. So like what these actually mean, because I've been collecting these furnitures from all around like villages and other places, the memories contained within these uh, objects, what it means actually to these uh, occupying these spaces without the human form again. I'm sorry, the images, they're quite, I, I show a lot of them because um, I've not shown a lot of these images before. It's like the first time, so it's important to see them. Uh, and these are the seats from the railway, uh, from the airplanes. So like the earlier image, what it, does it mean to take out the seats from inside the airplane? And what does it mean to be able to put it into, let's say, the parliament, where the airplane becomes a void for occupation, and also this place becomes, which is another void, which is being occupied by the residues from these other forms. Um, again, back through the, 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 the work in terms of using various objects, uh, even from like the, the form, the building itself, in terms of like old uh, steel trusses, uh, mats that are used actually in um, conversations, old uh, motorbikes that are like in relation to the history of the city, um, going back into like uh, the railway, into technological forms, into some of these halls and like trains that were being built and also some of the residues that we are borrowing again as a workshop and then uh, creating, let's say, uh, using the space again as a workshop or borrowing objects like uh, the, the old scales that were used in a lot of the post independent spaces, uh, when you go to like a lot of the old Nkrumah factories or even like some of the old colonial uh, infrastructures that were later de de uh, demolished, 
Um, these are these Avery scales coming from Birmingham, which I collected from Agbobolochi and other places. So, what does, yeah, for, for me the question is what does it mean for these uh, objects to be able to occupy uh, the spaces? And also, like, the, when we are digging these spaces, like, in terms of the artists, like, the drawings, that the notes that we make within these forms, what does it really mean, like, in terms of exploring, like, new artistic freedoms and all that? They almost look like these tombstones I later was looking at. And um, I, I was playing with the seats from the railway, again, within the same space, and I realized that there were some relationships that were within that um, and um, again, going back to the, the character of Assemblyman again, as someone who is still actively involved in like labor work, but at the same time uh, still doing, let's say, uh, tours or conversations with like uh, school pupil within the, within the space. And in certain other works of art within the space. So the space, it acts as a, it's, I don't know, I, I find it very hard to describe it because it's something that I've been thinking about and pondering. And all of these images that I'm showing are more like questions of things that are happening in my head, the things that I'm collecting, conversations that I'm having with people, and trying to find out what it means actually for looking at the question of life, both within an artistic sense and also beyond, uh, beyond art itself. This was the most uh, recent one, where we're looking at these old satellite forms, which are dotted across the northern region. Um, in, um, in thinking about how we, like, using them as uh, spaces for conversations and all that. I like the idea that um, even as these objects occupy these spaces, it still allows for certain conversations to be able to happen, or it opens up some of these conversations to be able to happen. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So there are details of, for instance, um, birds and other things uh, inhabiting these artworks because of the nature of the space um, in this space. So now we go back. We go to the last part of the the, the slides, which contain going back again to the the railway from the image on the left was taken in uh, Liverpool in 1927 of some of the buildings that were being constructed and taken apart and brought to Ghana actually for the construction of the railway, um, the workshops and other things, and versus us in Tamale trying to build, let's say, red clay, uh, manual labor, all kinds of other things. So um, I think they are very two different times in terms of what like the, the idea of labor and what it offers actually to a different uh, generation. Um, so I mostly like making these juxtapositions between these various images and actually what it means for, for artistic forms today in terms of like the new spirits that are created out of it. And uh, SCCA, which is the Savannah Center, was built as an artist studio, but the spirit of um, collective uh, the collective spirits and also looking at collaborations and all kinds of things inspired the transformation of this space into like a, a contemporary modern art institution that could somehow also go back in time to excavate practices of Dawson, Ajimanose, and many other projects that we're working on now. So we worked with the Black Star Alliance students from the campus. There were two very significant people, uh, Atto Jackson and Hassan Issa, who were who went to Mr. Dawson's studio to work with him uh, at the time to restore a lot of his work and also produce new works. And also Ajo Kisei, um, who did the introduction, was he, she had written her thesis on Mr. Dawson's work. So that was really important. That was the first step, actually, into looking at Mr. Dawson's work, which was uh, something that he was working with, with Dr. Karikacha anyway. So it was something that we had to push forward through this institution. And um, yeah, we, in terms of looking at like various collaborators, like people who have contributed, like looking at like uh, when we did, uh, when uh, IUB, uh, Tracy and uh, Ajua curated Ajimanose's exhibition, and we had to cover the whole floor with like uh, mud and soil. I was really very much interested in like the spirits of the community and with regards to like the projects that happen. Uh, I think Fred was the one who was cutting the plot of land for people to, <laughs> to build. 
Um, so that's Mr. Dawson and um, Ajimano say. And uh, yeah, so it's basically, I, I was looking at, the reason why I spent a long time looking at the, the ideas of the, the parliament and the forms that are coming from within it is because most of the times we think that a lot of these things are ridiculous because as an artist, it doesn't really make sense to do a lot of the things that we are seeing on the screen. Why would you even go through all the trouble to do all this kind of work? Yeah, but it's really, really important, particularly if we want to somehow go back into certain material forms that, that would lead to new ideological transformations in a way. And these, <laughs> these forms, <laughs> I think, yeah, sorry. These forms are very, uh, these forms are very important. Um, yeah. We have the last 10 images. Um, there are some of the images that are showing the artistic director, Selom Koji, uh, with um, school kids at the SCCA, where we've transformed it into classrooms where, like throughout Dawson's exhibition, we did a series of workshops. Yeah, so this, we did a series of workshops actually around the, yeah, around the exhibition. So it's very practical. I even, the, the furniture that you see from the exhibition, a lot of them were coming from the library here, the old library. They were throwing out some of the old furniture and then I collected them and took them to Tamale. And then we made them into like the infrastructure that built actually this new contemporary institution. So uh, like the parliament and other things, that was the point that I was trying to make, that the things that have become almost the things that we're discarding becomes a new point in time where we're able to like rethink about life and also how it inspires a newer generation. So that's Mr. Dawson with Selom and then also uh, two students from the painting and sculpture department who are doing uh, Ishmael and then Sedinam, who are doing their like uh, internship with us, uh, who also worked on the exhibition. Um, yeah, and these are examples of uh, both Dawson's show and then also um, Ajimano Say's exhibition. And yeah, like the, the images I was talking about before again, with regards to like the relationship between, let's say, the modern and the contemporary, going back and forth in between different times, and also what these images uh, represent and also mean. Uh, because uh, in a traditional, ordinary world, maybe these kinds of uh, encounters shouldn't have been possible. But it's very important that we, through art, we somehow revisit what encounters actually mean. Uh, again, as in Chroma Vuelene, this time, where uh, a whole generation has new ways of interacting or looking at artists' work. In the case of the current exhibition, Ana Alenzo's work from Venezuela, where their work actually deals with, let's say, certain ecological crisis and forms, which actually also goes back into the forms within the building. Um, the last exhibition at SCCA, uh, A Diagnosis of Time, also included a work by Tracy Thompson. Uh, and the forms that she normally creates in her work are particularly interesting with regards to her investigations into materials and also uh, what they become experientially and also just with regards to like the, um, the, the ideas that are buried and ab absorbed within it. So I remember Selom did a series of like uh, tours and workshops with like school kids where we're very honored actually to have uh, Tracy herself uh, do um, a workshop with the students where she transformed the space almost into a laboratory where she, we cooked uh, wache and other materials and then the students created their own forms and all that. So the, the, the point is that the, 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 the studio institution becoming a laboratory also allows for new forms to be created which in a traditional world maybe wouldn't have been um, and that's um, Sakite with the drone workshop classes that we do with regards to like using also technological forms for some of these transformations as I showed before. And this is a photograph of uh, red clay from the top where you see like various different, like the airplanes together with like the studio complex with residencies and all kinds of other things which we think that the artist practice now becoming a gift opens up conversations that wouldn't have opened up ordinarily. Um, yeah, so what does, so that these are the, the last points, like 
what does it mean for a generation? Like, in terms, because there are many different people who are helping for this big project, uh, for this big project to be happening now. Electricians, um, uh, masons, carpenters, uh, professors, um, shoe shine boys, kayis, all kinds of other people, both people who might be precarious and people who are also not precarious. But I like the idea that we all should think that we are, we are all in the same precarious situation. And whatever labor that we can all contribute actually to building up new forms within a society is something that we should bring together. Um, this was when we transported the airplanes to Tamale, um, where I took some series of drone photographs uh, across like different landscapes. Um, this was at Bupe, I think, the black voter uh, going into the northern region. Um, whether being it the artist using his studio like archives or drawings as pedagogical forms or tools to educate or to transform um, or using the studio space as a workshop for uh, projects, uh, uh, ex uh, workshops in the context of Ajimano Say's exhibition in 2020, together with like local participants and all that, to school children coming to see uh, the work of Eric Jemphy re-experimenting with photography, glass plates, and all kinds of other things. To ordinary people, again, coming to the institution to be able to reconnect with history through modern arts and also like contemporary reinterpretations in terms of like uh, reconstitutions and all that. Or just as again, ordinary people just come into the institution, families, just to be able to have an experience or to be able to transform the old notions of being or the old notions of thinking, or the, um, uh, the market women in Malamata market who were like the, the protagonist in the beginning, helping to re, uh, secure every sack uh, at the market space when everyone thought that this guy from the university must be a Sakawa boy because <laughs> why would you come and collect um, why would you come and collect uh, jute tatted sacks from us when you are doing an MFA? Yeah, so, but they, the belief, the idea that they, not, we don't necessarily need to understand, but the idea that we be, they believed in the possibilities that could emerge out of it is, um, is one of the questions that I'm asking myself. If we can be able to expand that within our society uh, through the forms that we are working with, or the, 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 yeah, the, the men, the local men within the community who excavated the entire Nkrumah Volney that we brought it back to life, that now we can reoccupy and also be able to deal with some of the ecological forms that exist within it. And the last image, this, which is um, professors and colleagues who commit actually to their practice, who commit their practice, intellectual labor, uh, actually in, into uh, the resurrection of spirits, forms, because without this community, this community or group of people, all this work that I have shared with you right now would have never happened. It started from there, but at the same time, we as a community are interested in this, like, this form of labor which multiplies in the form of assembly man and all forms of other characters that exist within our society or the women in the market. How do we create new forms within our time that somehow re-emancipates, but also creates new forms of freedom, even in the, most, uh, even in the biggest moments of crisis within uh, human history? So, um, yeah, I guess I have talked quite a lot, and <laughs> I will leave it here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ibrahim Mahama, for um, your 
highly informative and um, interesting presentation. Can, can we uh, give him another round of applause? Thank you. Uh, he started with an image of community and emphasized how the attitude towards community has helped him throughout his work. Um, he also mentioned the significant moments uh, that the work starts expanding, uh, particularly the Venice uh, moment that also showed huge potential in an otherwise discarded material and how that attitude has followed through uh, projects that he has created and spaces and opportunities that are being created for um, others. He mentions or speaks a lot about the communities that inspire the work but also are involved uh, exemplified in uh, Assemblyman, who helps with building, but also is so invested that he can take people um, on tours in the same space, quite contrary to what happens in uh, the larger uh, art institutions. There's a lot that he says, but there's one uh, particular thing that uh, stood out for me, especially at the very end when he says, we are all in a precarious situation and we all need to contribute our lot. I think these and many more are things that we learn from him. But since he's uh, still standing here, we want to just have a short engagement with the public. Um, anybody who has a comment, a question, uh, something that is baffling them that they need to pick from um, the presenter. Kindly raise your hand, we'll rush over to you, and um, we'll see if we can find answers uh, from uh, Ibrahim Ahama. Uh, there's a hand there. Okay, so um, my name is Roosevelt Okodia Gansa, and I wanted to either ask or talk about um, art in the sense that we now have a wider scope of what art is. And I'd like to ask, do we now put art in a sense where it's more functional in that sense or in that scope, or do we still see it in the old sense where we understand art to be um, what you create hang around or something that we actually use, something that solves problems, something that goes beyond the, the usual, the past. Um, no, thank do, you. Do we, yeah. I, I, yeah, art goes beyond the function, yeah. So sometimes it can also be symbolic. Uh, sometimes it can be political. It's not every work of art. There are some works of art which are made, which are actually not meant to be hanged or to be put into any domestic space. So that's why I went through the trouble of showing all those different images within the parliament. Imagine it's an independent artist's work, which is taking so many years to do. But yeah, it's more or less, it's an institutional work that allows for us to be able to, yeah, it, it creates, I don't know, it, it, if, uh, it, creates, it, it creates its own space or its own time that allows us to be able to go into it, to be able to look at certain forms within it. Uh, whereas maybe uh, works of art that are objects, that's why I said that as an artist, I can make works that are objects, that can hang, that can be formal, but at the same time, when you're looking at the wider independent practice as an artist in terms of what it can do and the promises within it, then as an artist, you can maybe push those uh, spaces a lot more. So I think it's more or less about the freedoms within the forms that we work with and how we can expand them further. That leads us. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Ibrahim. My name is Ibrahim Asumin. Okay, please, what has been your biggest challenge in the industry 
I want to know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't think I have any challenge, actually. For me, everything, uh, as I said before, we are ground zero. So uh, nothing, if nothing works, that's the, that's, it's a gift, actually, because it gives you, uh, yeah, it gives you, it, it gives you another, yeah, it, it creates, it creates the space for you to be able to think and operate in a certain manner that you wouldn't be able to. I guess uh, generally people hope that within the, within the creative art institutions that are happening, like uh, both in the music, theater, whatever, the, yeah, there can be a lot more support within it with regards to like um, supporting artists' works or even like paying attention to like, let's say, creative practices and things like that. But unfortunately, within our society, it's not the case. But then again, that's the only reason why we can do the work that we do because it creates another space for us to be able to operate. There are freedoms within it. Yeah, so mostly when it comes to that, I've realized that when I actually, when I'm actually quite limited, that's when I'm able, to, that's when I'm most productive, actually, because uh, you, you push yourself and you want to be able to make something happen, regardless of all the obstacles and challenges that are there. But of course, eventually, the reason why we're doing the work that we're doing is because we want it to be able to change the system itself. There needs to be a systematic change one day. So we don't talk about some of these things, like with regards to people wanting, people being limited by their creativities because maybe the system is not functioning or things are not happening. Um, yeah, so I guess from my point of view, I'm just using what I have in order to be able to create. But beyond us as a generation, we should be able to create uh, new systems that can also inspire yeah, a new, uh, new generations of uh, practitioners or thinkers or whatever. Yeah. I'll just add a little, on a lighter note, um, that even when there were challenges like the light of Ibrahim continued to give his presentation. So, <laughs> So the void is always implied in the work. Thank you very much. And I think it's also inspired uh, other artists. For example, last year, uh, there was an exhibition um, in the Kenya University Botanical Garden titled Failure is the Key, uh, done by uh, Hassan and his colleagues. So I think we learned a lot from uh, these moments. Thank you. Any more? I saw a hand up here. Uh, okay, Prof. Um, my brother, I do not know where to start from, but uh, that was some excellent presentation. And uh, listening to you all along, I kept asking myself, if somebody in a very, very recurrent mode keeps asking the question, what does this mean? What does this mean to me? What does this mean to me? Then, I would want to brand that person in terms of their concept of reality to be multiple in nature and different in terms of your particular orientation. At the same time, I have this very feeling, intuitive, that the more I think of you and I want to say that I know who you are and I understand from what you have just said, then the more I also tell myself I probably didn't understand fully the question asked me who is Ibrahim Mahama. Am I wrong or right? Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, <laughs> I'm struggling even to understand myself. <laughs> it's a question, yeah. A lot of the things that I'm doing, they are not answers per se, they are just questions. And I don't have the answers to them. But through those questions, it opens up forms that even inspires the work itself. Because sometimes there are forms or things that you've done that you go back to again and again. It's not as if as soon as you do it, it's done. 
you keep going back to the same space again and again, asking questions because each moment in time, because if we were to take the concept of the universe even in itself and were to travel through time at the speed of light, we'll realize that things, in the order of things, would be different. Or even if we were to be able to break through a multiverse or whatever, we realize that there are like many constellations of different things with regards to arrangements, with regards to forms, attitudes, spirits, and all that. So for me, one moment, I'm in a certain spirit so that I can do something. In another moment, I'm totally not in that spirit. But it all comes within the person. Yeah, so, and all of us. And through harnessing all of these in different forms, we can be able to do something together in a way. So it's just a question that I think that our generation, we need to think about. Because we take a lot of these things for granted. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. I would say that was a wonderful presentation. And then mine is more or less like a compliment and then it goes this way. Um, I am not an art student. I'm, a, a, I'm reading food science. And I would say that your presentation has given me a wide scope that there is more to what we perceive as failure and then we are out to make a difference. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's really good. I think when people think of failure, they mostly think of it as an end in itself. But it's material. Yeah, it's like a state of being that we can tap into, we can go into, and then we can actually draw or take things from it. Yeah, it's actually very powerful. Of course, we don't hope, we don't start thinking that we're going there. But once it happens, it's something that you have to take time to look at to be able to open new forms from it. Yeah. Where's the last question? Um, there was a last question. Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Richard Fosu Sasses from the publishing department. When you were doing um, the presentation, I was just here and I was asking myself, what's in for me, what's in for me? And I was like, no, what's in for us? With your presentation and your work, which involves professors, market women, and folks from the community like Assemblyman, I think it's something that the youth coming should emulate. We should be thinking about their community, not me, not myself. So I was asking my colleague here if you've spoken about documentation of your work. So mine has to do with something to document what you are doing so that generations here to come will emulate your work. So it's a kind of suggestion. If there's nothing like documentation, I would like to suggest you document your work so that those of us not here and those of us, those of um, the generations here to come will emulate your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I think we are done for time, but we want to thank everybody who has asked questions. Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, ask your question. Yeah, let's go. Um, thank you for the insightful presentation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, over the years, um, art has evolved. Art has really evolved. And many, for example, I myself, before entering the, this institution, I had this idea of painting a sculpture to be the fine art, like painting, placing it in your room, making public sculptures. But this presentation has really opened up to me and has shown that um, painting and sculpture or contemporary art in these years has broadened its wings to blend the margin between sociology. It's like a kind of social intervention. Buying these planes, taking it into the community for the, the pupils to interact, and even the people, some of them are not students, but still have the chance to um, do that. So I would like to ask you, what statement are you trying to make um, with this? Because there are lots of disciplines in here, as I said, are publishing food science. So what statements are you trying to make with this in terms of how art has evolved and its um, target now? 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess it boils down to the question of responsibility. Yeah, that's it at the end of the day. It's all about responsibility. Are we willing to take responsibility for things within the society that we are in? And are we willing to open up forms beyond what they are, actually? Because when we encounter situations, because most people always complain, oh, but it's not this, it's not working, da 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 da. But if we have the chance to be able to make a significant contribution towards renewed forms of thinking, what will we do? It mostly comes through social work. And um, in art, of course, if we say that we're going to, an artist could be making uh, objects which still deal with those social forms, but sometimes an artist also wants to work with social forms materially with our, which are within society in order to be able to open up things. One of the things I didn't talk about was the idea of um, buying uh, land within the, let's say, community, within the red clay uh, area, Jena Trang. Lands that are meant for, let's say, either schools or agriculture or like sacred lands or things like that. Whereas you know that in our country, like no one, like if, we, if lands are being zoned for, um, if lands are being zoned for let's say schools or whatever, eventually they rezone them as commer uh, like commercial properties or like residential plots or things like that. But if we're able to intervene within some of these things, and we're able to like really reach out uh, uh, some of these directions, then it opens up other possibilities in the future. So the question of responsibility comes in. So the work is not so much about all the things that I've shown, but about what it produces. It's about what it produces, the spirit that comes out of it. Because at the end of the day, you might produce all of this only to gather a certain spirit in order to be able to create something that somehow opens up uh, further emancipations within the society. So the, 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 the point of responsibility is keen. What happens when there's a void and we have to fill it up? What, what decisions are we going to make? Or how are we going to fill it up? Or how are we going to interpret it? That is the, it's a question. It's not so much about, it's not a solution. It's more of a question. And through that, multiple things can happen. I don't have to do the same thing that you do, but at least ethically and morally, you have to think about it and you have to think that it's something that is going to multiply itself across a much wider uh, society or generation. Thank you very much. We've clapped, but let us give a rousing round of applause to Ibrahim Mahama. Thank you very much. In trying to make something out of a void, Ephraim Amu created a poem that spoke to the aspirations of the KNUST dream. And it translates roughly as we have entered a deep forest. We shall work hard to transform it into a city that many would come and visit it. And I guess this is the potential that is hidden in a void. Many years after that poem was written, somebody like Ibrahim Mahama is making actual the idea of the void. We thank you very much for, having, uh, for coming to share your work with us. We now invite Mr. Kwesi Ohiniaye to offer a vote of thanks uh, since we have come to this point, almost to the end. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Bernard Akwe Jackson. Um, Ibrahim always leaves us spellbound. Tonight is one of such days. Uh, one of the things I take from the session is that the artist is not only 
recalling history or histories, he's also using them. And by using history, he's creating new histories and inevitably uh, new futures. So for that, I, I for one, but I'm sure I speak for everybody that we are profoundly grateful. Um, first of all, to Ibrahim Mahama for your very important work, for the work that you have done and work that you continue to do. Um, but I don't think it's out of place to ask for another standing ovation for our presenter. So please, let us give a warm ovation to Ibrahim Mahama. Thank you. Thank you all. You may be seated. Um, we are grateful as well to the provost of the College of Art and Built Environment. We are grateful to the dean of faculty, to the vice dean of faculty, um, to the senior members uh, who are all here, invited guests, both those seated here in the auditorium as well as those who joined us virtually via uh, Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. We are grateful to all of you for making the time and honoring our invitation. Uh, to the students, to the technical team, to the media uh, teams, to um, everybody who has, especially through the, uh, the events of the evening, you have all helped us in resolving um, the issues that came up. A big thank you to the university community, um, to the College of Art and Built Environment, the heads of departments, to the uh, Opokuwari II Museum, Black Star Lines, Kumasi, um, Savannah Center for Contemporary Art, Tamale, Red Clay, Nkrumah Volene, um, all of these institutions have played their own roles in making tonight a success. Before I leave, I'll say a few words about the Opokuwari II Museum or the KNUST Museum. We, for those of us who might not know its location, we are located on the Africa Hall Road on KNUST campus. We are presently hosting three exhibitions, two of which are within the interior spaces of the building, and the third is sited in the open air within the convivial and congenial spaces of the Chermating Park. Dignity in Labor, which, is, uh, which opened in 2019, is our longest running exhibition. The show emphasizes the founding ethos of the Kumasi College of Technology, which was between 1952 and 1961, and KNUST between 1961 and the present. Uh, the second is a traveling exhibition, a traveling photography exhibition titled Simply Iconic Vintage Images Beaten Off, Vintage Images of the Beaten Path. And it opened in Accra in 2001. It uh, was curated by Dr. Bernard Akwe Jackson, and uh, it, it moved to Kumase um, later that year. So the exhibition interplays vintage or archival photographs sourced from both private and institutional collections with contemporary approaches to image making. Then our most recent exhibition is titled The Powerhouse, which opened this year. It's a collaborative effort between the Kunsthalle Bonn in Germany and the KNUST Museum. It's a group show that features 23 artists from the African world with 36 
exclusively augmented reality artworks distributed around the Chemating Park in a Pokemon Go-esque adventure. All you need on site is your smartphone or your tablet. No apps, no admission fee, no closing times. And this is the first exhibition of its kind staged by the KNUST Museum. We are also working feverishly on activating relevant historical sites, landscapes, and monuments around the KNUST campus, beginning with the Ifremamu Drum Tower near the commercial area on campus, as well as um, other statues and sculptures spanning the breadth of the, of, of the entire KNUST campus. We will call on you for support uh, when the time comes. Thank you once again, and enjoy your evening. Thank you, Chrissy Ohini, also known as IUB. Uh, um, we are almost at the end of our evening, and uh, we started with a prayer. We want to end with a prayer. We invite Dr. Mrs. Dorothy Akpene Amenuke to help us with the closing prayer. Shall we pray? Shall we be upstanding? Father, we thank you for this evening and we thank you for the opportunity to have one of us sharing his work with us. We thank you that being um, Professors and lecturers and students have come to be witnessing this and learn many things from this. We pray that you help us to assimilate and then digest what we have experienced this evening to our benefit and to the glory of your name. As we leave, we commit ourselves into your hands, commit the whole university into your hands, Pray that you continue to guide us as you've always done. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. Oh, please don't go. Please, uh, um, let's stay around. Uh, we are inviting the uh, provosts, the heads of department, the um, deans, um, particularly of the um, College of Art and Built Environment and um, student executive for all the groups uh, to join us and senior members to join us uh, in a photograph with the presenter. So quickly, <laughs> let's come. Um, the rest, please we may uh, remain seated. We are performing the photograph. Which way? With the light? The light is behind us. Or? Uh, so how do we How we see it? And we can put it off. Man, we can put this off. Okay, sorry for keeping you. Uh, please, you may disperse. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>